Welcome to the Financial Advisor Success Podcast, where you go behind the scenes with financial planner, speaker, and consultant Michael Kitsis to hear stories of how leading financial advisors navigated the inevitable challenges that arise on the path to success and get insight from leading industry consultants about how to break through to the next level in your advisory business. And now here's your host, Michael Kitsis. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the 105th episode of the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. My guest on today's podcast is Chip Munn. Chip is the co-founder and managing partner of Signature Wealth, a hybrid wealth management firm on the Raymond James platform that has quickly grown from $300 million to over $1 billion of assets in just the past few years. What's unique about Chip, though, is the way that he's grown the firm, with an acquisition strategy focused on buying books of business from advisors who are retiring and leaving the industry, and then handing them off to younger advisors who can service the clients, and using the credibility and experience of the firm and its team to help clients get comfortable with the transition to their new young advisor. In this episode, we talk in depth about what it was like for Chip's firm as they transitioned from a regional broker-dealer to the independent model under Raymond James, how trying to hire staff and gain economies of scale created challenges in growing the advisory business, why Chip ultimately decided to create an option for other advisors to affiliate under Signature to solve those challenges for other solo advisors, and why there's still such an opportunity to support advisory firms that have chosen the independent model, because being independent doesn't necessarily mean that we want to be alone. We also talk about Chip's process for acquiring advisory firms, how they created a structured questionnaire for the advisor to dictate answers to in order to quickly build a historical record of all of a client's relevant information, the way they focus on telling the story of Signature Wealth and its greater resources to persuade the clients to stay through the transition, how they position young lead advisors as part of a team to get transitioning clients comfortable, and how they do semi-annual events for clients in each branch office location to keep clients engaged with the firm. And be certain to listen to the end, where Chip talks about his own evolving role in the advisory business as it grows, the way he's reallocated a portion of his time from developing client relationships to developing team members, how he's identified his own unique ability, and the way that he repositioned leadership duties with his business partner in recognition that he's a visionary and his partner is the business integrator. And so with that introduction, I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Financial Advisor Success Podcast with Chip Munn. Welcome, Chip Munn, to the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. Thank you. It's great to be here. I'm looking forward to today's podcast because you, you've had a, a very interesting growth journey as I've, I've come to learn about your firm in this breakaway transition from a, a regional broker dealer to the independent BD side and doing what I think is a kind of a unique version of an, I guess, an acquisition tuck-in kind of model for growing your book with retiring advisors and about a really fast growth cycle from a couple hundred million dollars to over a billion dollars. And and I've lived certainly through some fast-growing companies. I know that that puts you in a lot of turmoil and change just as a leader and owner of the firm about all the things you got to start doing differently at the, as the business grows rapidly and bulks up. And so Looking forward to just talking about business growth, fast growth in an advisory firm, acquisitions, and and you know, what that does to us as advisors as our role starts changing in the business. Great. So maybe to get started, why don't you just tell us a little bit about your advisory firm as it exists today? Like paint for us a little bit of a picture of the firm and what it is you do. Sure. Well, we are we're an independent firm affiliated with uh, Raymond James Financial Services. And we were originally, for the last probably 15 years or so, 14, 15 years, we were with a regional broker-dealer. Back in February of 2016, we had gone through you know, various struggles with trying to be able to do more and do different. And that kind of structure, it, we found it difficult. I have a partner who, uh, in my kind of original practice, if you will, who lived in uh, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. So he was about an hour out of, you know, from our home office. And we felt like... Where where are you guys in South Carolina then? uh, We're in Florence, South Carolina. Okay. And so it's about, you know, 60 miles or so from Myrtle Beach. And so we had some experience uh, working with uh, a different, having some remote work. And we felt like there was a lot of opportunity 
in the marketplace for being able to, our average age of a partner at the time was roughly 45. And kind of looking at what we felt like the landscape was, we felt like there were a lot of advisors who were in their 60s who at some point would want to transition out of the business. And there were a lot of young folks in their early 20s, maybe who wanted to get into the business. But yeah, our kind of hypothesis was a 65-year-old isn't necessarily looking to transition directly to a 25-year-old. And so we felt like we could provide an opportunity to bridge in between those two folks, provide you know, some training and some gray hair, even if you will, so that the legacy advisor and his clients could feel comfortable that, you know, there was somebody with some experience involved, but also could transition that fairly quickly to a younger advisor to handle some of the, you know, relationship management and, and service uh, duties. So where, where were you previously before you went to Raymond James? We were with uh, Hilliard Lions, uh, okay. regional BD, and then, you know, again, know, came uh, here. Recently in the news because they got uh, acquired by Baird, I think. Yeah, I think I saw that. Good for them. Great company, uh, great culture. We we enjoyed that part. But, you know, again, for somebody like me uh, who considers himself to be unemployable at this point in my career, it is uh, it's one of those things where you just wanted more freedom. And we didn't feel like we, we had it, enough of that to suit us. So was that the the driver, like you said, you sort of had struggles of wanting to do, like wanting to do more and, and different things than what you could there? Like, was it around like what you were implementing with clients or what you're charging in business model or more directly around this, like, hey, we want to acquire advisors and tuck them in because there's people retiring and young advisors who want in and we think we can you know, be a matchmaker in the middle, but you just couldn't do that on the Hilliard platform? Probably a combination of the two. You know, uh, when you have a branch office network at, at any firm, I'm sure there are constraints around that. And so that wasn't something we felt like we had a, a lot of opportunity on. But also one of the things that for me, I, I find the all of the areas of our business to be very fascinating. So things that you all have done via XYPN and the RIA model and, you know, the ability to really just to run your own business and to make your own decisions, whether that's an acquisition or whether that is delving into new technology or marketing or, you know, even as an independent, you know, you have a lot more freedom and flexibility on things like even just having a Facebook page and being able to do some of that. You know, we just had some limitations that for me in looking at where I, yeah, I just don't think that a financial advisory business should have to be that much different than any other small to mid-sized business. And so, you know, wanted to be able to have more flexibility in in how we ran our practice. And so, you know, we had to, uh, we just had to do something different. I find that striking though, because I feel like a lot of the, a lot of the movement amongst broker dealers these days is driven a lot by the the financials, you know, recruiting bonuses, payout rates, uh, you know, just differences in grids. Like, w- was that a factor for you as well? Or was this Nah, it's not really about the numbers. Like we just have a vision of growing in a certain way that we don't think we can do where we are. Like, you know, just more more style culture. I mean, to suggest that the numbers don't matter probably would be, you know, disingenuous. I mean, I, I think that every financial advisor we deal in numbers for our clients every day. And you, you know, one of one of the kind of eight things, you know, when we're talking to other advisors, one of the eight things that we focus on is practice finances. I mean, that's an important you have to know your numbers, but for us, um, it definitely was not about, you know, going independent. You're not doing it for, you know, a, a transition check. That's not the, it, it really has to be more about uh, building the kind of business that you want, but also, you know, for us, the concept of being able to build enterprise value, being able to work with the people that you want to work with in building kind of your own vision was much more the 
kind of driving force for us than the financials. And so it is one of the things that I've found is in, in talking with advisors kind of from all of the different uh, areas is the financial part can be really confusing because it depends on who it is that you're talking to. Everybody kind of has their, you know, it's, I hate to equate it to buying a car, but if you look at, if you go and look at three different kinds of cars, whoever it is that's presenting or selling it to you is going to highlight the importance of their features, you know, the features and benefits of their particular model. And I think that, you know, as advisors, we have to really have a clear vision for what it is that we're trying to accomplish to determine whether or not, you know, one particular model works best. What we have tried to do, you know, in becoming independent and now in growing kind of our business is, you know, a lot of the stuff in going independent is hard. (laughs) It was more than we, if I'm being honest, more than we expected. And, you know, we had more decisions on the front end than, you know, you, you read a lot and you listen to the podcast like yours and you try to, you know, expect the unexpected and, and pay attention to that stuff. But it ended up being way more in terms of the, the running a business side of things than we originally expected. And so after kind of getting over the wall of doing that, What I found was in in talking to some former colleagues of mine and and folks that I know around the industry, that's what keeps a lot of people in the, you know, in the wirehouse type space or the regional space is the the notion of I really don't want to deal with that part. And so from the beginning, when we looked at leaving and coming and starting Central Wealth, we decided that we would document everything that we did along the way as if someone was going to come behind us. And so, you know, our transition, you know, how we set up everything, we made a point of of kind of documenting all that stuff so that that way, uh, with the model that we anticipated, we wanted to be able to share that with other people. And it has been, you know, it's proven to be helpful here over the first three years or so. So, so help us understand what Signature Wealth looks like today. Like, how big is the firm? I don't know if you measure by uh, clients or revenue or assets or, or staff. But like, what is the, what does the firm overall look like today? Sure. Well, we measure all those things, but you know, ultimately, just to give you some, uh, when we originally moved over and started Signature Wealth from our previous life, we were in terms of AUM about three hundred million, and our office here in Florence uh, today, almost three years later, we are about one point one billion, eight offices, and fifteen advisors up from there were four uh, of us originally and so you know our structure allows it's designed for flexibility so we have three well two uh, a third one coming next month three offices that are acquisitions and then four others that are kind of affiliates satellites if you will but who uh, are making use of our shared services kind of back office structure, but that we don't own the practice. So we partner with the advisor to, they run their their own practice, but have use of all of our back office, you know, kind of any of the systems that we've developed, transition for those who came from outside the firm. And then, you know, that, so they take advantage of those things, but we are not equity owners in their practice. And I'm presuming, and, and everyone's on the Ray J platform because you kind of have to be to have them as your broker dealer. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. And what does this look like from a business model perspective? Like, are these all advisory accounts? Are you still doing some brokerage? Do you do like insurance business, annuity business? Like, what's the what's the business model and revenue mix for the practice? I think. Yeah, our practice has been around since 1970. So for a lot of practices, you know, and if at some point you want to get into kind of how that originally, you know, going back years, uh, how that got started. But like a lot of practices that have been around for 
that long. We we still have you know some commission based business, uh, whether that's you know trails uh, from either mutual funds or annuities. But like most people, I think we've we've definitely drifted from a new business standpoint towards the advisory model. It's preferable for me and for us, but we definitely still have a you know, a substantial amount of the, you know, again, kind of that traditional commission-based business. And so it is one of the things I think that for us does allow us in talking to advisors, it allows us the opportunity to be able to have conversations with people who, you know, again, maybe have been in a wirehouse for or, or a regional for 20 years and have a, a business mix that, that doesn't suit kind of to go purely RIA. And so it, it it opens up a lot of doors for us, but we definitely are, you know, probably 65% advisory and trending in that direction. And was that part of the the driving decision to go to a firm like Ray J as opposed to going out to the RIA channel? Like you had a either some combination of enough commission trails that you wanted to hold on to them. So you needed to find a hybrid platform or you specifically wanted to acquire hybrid advisors. So you wanted to be on a hybrid platform to acquire them. Well, w- one of the things, you know, I want to have flexibility and, and I think that uh, the platform uh, on the independent side at Raymond James offers uh, us and you know, anybody that works with us in whatever capacity, an awful lot of flexibility to do business. You know, our name signature came from the concept of really my wife is a creative and a a marketing person. And she asked me one time when we were trying to figure out what we would name it, you know, if I could boil it down to one word, uh, what would it be? And, And the word for me was unique in that our businesses, our advisors are unique, our clients are unique, but Unique wealth management didn't exactly, you know, I think the domain was probably taken already. It was just not something that, you know, but we couldn't think of anything that was more unique than than our signature. And so the idea for us of being able to have flexibility for our clients to be able to do the kind of business, you know, to be able to do business their way where, you know, I have a, a client coming in tomorrow who is a flat fee. So we have the ability to do X number of dollars a year or AUM or, you know, again, in a very limited capacity, you know, we can do insurance business and, and have commissions for that. Not necessarily a big focus, but, you know, it, it offers an awful lot of room for people to be able to do the kind of business that, uh, again, as long as it's legal, moral and ethical, they can do the kind of business that works best for them. So. With some offices that are acquisitions under your firm, you know, part of your part of your equity, and then a subset of firms where you're the, you're essentially a back office servicing firm for the downstream advisor. I'm assuming that just the the economics and the structure of those look look differently. So, like, how do you split? I guess I got a few questions. One is just how how do you split between the two of like of the 1.1 billion? What's like What's your internal AUM and what's your you know, downstream advisors we're servicing AUM? Like, do you do you separate them that way? Uh, we don't typically, but I think that the kind of owned office equity is about seven hundred million. Okay, and the you know downstream or, or the affiliate satellite is uh, probably in the four hundred range. And how do you structure arrangements like that? I mean, I, I think we, well, we all kind of get the, you know, the the equity and like just the clients of the firm pay a fee, advisors get compensated, uh, hopefully a profit margin left for the firm. But w- like, what does an affiliate back office model look like in your context? I think there are a lot of advisors out there on BD platforms, on hybrid BD platforms that are are interested in this model of what what would it look like if I tuck some other advisors in but like nobody seems to be clear about how you just how you structure that like how do you charge for that do sure do you get overrides does Ray J pay you do they pay you like just 
How do those deals work? Yeah, our our deal at this point essentially is an override. So it, it's essentially that we work with our branch offices and they receive a flat payout. And so, you know, it is a, generally speaking, there is a difference between what we are paid and what they're paid. And, and we keep the, the spread or the override in between the two. And, you know, we disclose all of that to the, you know, to the office owner. And, you know, what we have done thus far is right now we have what I would call kind of a core group of services that include things like, you know, some very, at this moment, very basic marketing, HR, finance, operations type stuff. We handle all the payroll benefits, you know, those kinds of things, compliance. And so that would be what I would call kind of core services. Uh, Over time, we are, you know, continuing to work with the folks who have come on board as to what their needs are. You know, I've I've found that, you know, at one point we considered centralizing, we we have centralized uh, investment management for our owned offices, but for folks who come on board, some folks, a lot of the advisors that we have had, they kind of have their own preferred way of handling asset management. And so, you know, that's something that at some point we could offer as a service. But thus far, the folks that we've worked with haven't, that's just not a real hot button thing for them. I, I think that we'll end up, pardon? You know, so you're, you're, you're kind of covering just the, the core overhead, like back office things that just every advisor needs and it's a pain in the butt to hire that nobody wants to do a solo advisor. No, no, all those things that when we came over that were just a pain in the neck to have to deal with, you know, one of the biggest fears, we had an advisor group and another independent advisor affiliate with us earlier this year and just having group benefits, a, a larger group benefits, save them five or $600 per person per month. So just little oh, things. Just on like group health insurance bargaining as well. Yeah. It's just things that you, you don't, uh, again, I mean, when we came over, we did Cobra insurance for the right. first year to try to figure out, you know, you're just kind of putting it together. And, and so for the folks that have joined us here in the last you know, 18 months, just the ability to feel like they could be independent, but not alone. And to have some sort of structure and, and a big thing for us is is finding like minded people. You know, I when we left the regional kind of firm culture, one of the things that I missed was the interaction with my colleagues and having other folks to bounce ideas off of and, and that feeling that as attractive as being able to forge your own path is it can also be one that's kind of lonely. So, you know, your old friends can't do the same things or or don't have access to the the same kind of potential platforms and technologies and those kinds of things. And so it can, you can feel a little bit isolated. And so for us being able to, you know, we were fortunate kind of the way that we originally expanded was I had a friend who was uh, one of our former wholesalers. So he was a wholesaler that covered us for probably 10 years. And I found out about nine months after we joined Raymond James that he had bought a practice in Charlotte, North Carolina, and was considering Raymond James. And so yeah, I reached out to him and said, don't know what your plans are, but if you're going to, you know, if you're considering Raymond James, I think that we offer a lot of structure that would be be helpful for you. And so, you know, I may have told you at one point, we then later added a former regional director from Raymond James came in and is one of our partners. And that was a, again, kind of part of what has evolved is really just, you know, it's a lot about relationships and keeping aware of, of people that you know and not feeling like you want to be by yourself. And that's been a big thing for us. We found a similar phenomenon, frankly, for XY Planning Network. And I think it's just true with the overall, the rise of, you know, super OSJs in the broker-dealer community as, as well, and, and various platforms and roll-ups that are starting to emerge in the RAA space. Like, 
there's a whole lot of advisors, I think, that are in that mentality. You put it so well that like, I, I want to be independent, but I don't necessarily want to be alone. And trying to find the midpoint between those, like I want to keep my independence and my control, but I don't want to feel alone. I would like to have a platform that gives me some stuff and support. Like that's that's now a space to me that seems to be blossoming across every different version of an independent channel at once uh, with firms rising up and say like, we'll do some of that stuff. We'll create that environment for you where you're, you're independent, but not alone. And you've got some structure and you've got some support and you've got some peers, but you're independent and, and still your firm and it's still your equity. So if that's, what's important to you, like you can, you can hold on to that. For sure. And if you focus on culture, and bringing in the kind of folks that fit in with the other, again, regardless of the ownership structure, matters less than the, I think, the the psychological makeup of the people who are involved. It, it is, I mean, one of the advisors that is now with us in Lexington, Kentucky, we were on, we were at the same broker dealer years ago on an advisory board together trying to move them forward, you know, and coming up with new ideas. And we, we work together in trying to help the firm overall progress. And eventually when, you know, she reached out to me to see, you know, what we were doing, it became a situation where it's kind of like, you know, we really wanted to do this as part of a bigger organization. But, you know, I know you and what your vision is, and you know me, why don't we do it together? And, and yeah, I, I've joked with her. It's a little bit like the uh, the Peyton Manning and uh, Brad Paisley commercial, you know, where he said, we're going to put the band back together. Uh, I think that, you know, for the two of us, it was a lot like, like that to say we have a shared vision. Each of us wants to be able to implement bits and pieces of it in our own way. She has an, an all female advisory team that's phenomenal with, you know, women executives. And, you know, so she wants to be able to do some of that her own way. But the bigger picture vision of, you know, of, of both of ours is very much the same, real similar. So, so for advisors that, that affiliate, like I, I realize you may have slightly different structures with each as the, if these evolve over time, but can you just give us some like context of how this works as a firm if you're trying to you know serve them and generate revenue and 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 make it work from your end like d- are you participating in 5 or 10% of their grid or are you participating in like 20 or 30% because that's what it takes to provide all the staff infrastructure support that you're providing is it more than that like what does this look like or at least what what neighborhood is this Generally speaking, it's between the five and 10. Okay. So uh, it's not, yeah, I think that as our business evolves, I think that, you know, we can cover kind of the core services between five and 10. And again, because if you, if as a, as a partner, you're taking too much, you don't allow enough. I mean, there's not enough money in it for the, you know, for your partner to be able to do the things that they want to do if they're they're paying too much. You know, there are some models where essentially, you know, a it, it, you're on an independent platform, but you're you're paid more like a wirehouse advisor, and that's not our you know our model. We we again kind of stay in that range, and then what I can anticipate we will do over time is as we develop other services, and we've done this some kind of in beta is, uh, you know, whether it's marketing campaigns that folks can roll out in their local market or, you know, th- those kinds of things would be a la carte. Most of it thus far, anything beyond core services, we kind of have a preferred vendors list and folks that we've kind of negotiated with to be able to provide that. But we don't, at this point, it would, it would be something that we, we have a, a list of resources that we don't provide in house yet. But if it if it became such, you, you just want to. Uh, there's no sense in one of the biggest frustrations for me in my previous life was paying for things that I didn't use. And so, you know, when you are in a situation for a long enough time that you 
realize that somebody like you doesn't like that, then when you get an opportunity to build your own organization, you want to do it in a way that somebody like you would appreciate being able to do business like that. And we've tried to tried to remember that kind of as we grow. So I'm just imagining this from the advisor's end. So if someone comes in, they're doing $300,000 of GDC, you know, you're having this conversation with them and, and saying like, look, you know, uh, you know, we'll, we'll draw 10% of your, of your grid or about $30,000, but you know, we'll be doing your compliance support and your HR and your employee benefits and your finance and supporting on marketing and all these other items. And just as an advisor, like I'm going to sit down and say, well, either I think that's worth the, the 10% or, or 30 grand or not, but for most independent advisors, like those would, those would be either a whole bunch of different hires or a whole bunch of different part-timers I have to manage, which is a pain. So you know, one consolidated check to you to provide all this stuff sounds pretty handy. That like that would that would be the sale. That would be the inconvenient. I mean, it's it, when you're in the independent space, you, you're you make business decisions every day, and I think that that's a big part of again why we are an option. Is you know when we originally made the transition with the original group, we had a kind of a internally we were a big enough team to have somebody who pretty much only did compliance and who, you know, so he focused on that and somebody else who focused on operations. And I did the planning, my partner for 20 years, I've done planning. He's done investments. Uh, I don't manage my own money. I don't have quotes on my computer. So it is, um, you know, we had the basics of that. And then for us, everything going forward becomes a business decision. And so for our partners, I think it's the same way. You decide whether or not you want to do the compliance or pay somebody to do it, you know, and and that's true of, of all the different things. What we found is it is cheaper for, and, and again, looking at this for myself as a business owner, it was cheaper for me in a lot of ways to expand and share resources with somebody else. And we even have offices who partner individually on certain things, you know, marketing wise, let's say, whether it's a content writer or, uh, you know, somebody to run their Facebook where it's cheaper to have two of you splitting one expert in something than it is. Uh, That's the concept, even on a a macro scale. I mean, it's, it's the, it's the essence of growing businesses, get economies of scale. And and I mean, I feel like the advisor world and particularly the independent advisor world has had, I don't know, like 30 plus years as long as the IBD movement has been around, 30 plus years of advisors coming together in loose partnerships, where I kind of put partnerships in air quotes because it's really like, look, I run my business and you run your business, but we're going to share the office rent and you know, the, the salary for a front office admin person to handle the clients and maybe an ops person. And, and like, we're basically in a resource sharing cost splitting partnership. Like th- those have been out there for a long time. The, the phenomenon to me that's interesting and is firms like yours that are, are not just saying like, you know, hey, Jim, let's come together and, and split salary so that we can have a full timer between the two of us you're at a whole other level with it already when you've got eight office locations and a billion plus aggregate dollars, a big chunk of which is rolling up under this. And now you can hire a bunch of staff that are each, you know, fractionally available to the various advisors on the platform. And just you, you can do more and you start benefiting from all the economies of scale that, that can exist in larger advisory firms. But you're not requiring them necessarily to roll up and be your advisory firm. You're kind of an, an intermediate platform for them on the Ray J platform and Ray J does its share. Sure. Well, and, and for us, it's a lot of it's about leverage, right? I mean, as financial advisors, cause again, you know, with the exception, actually now we are all financial advisors. So, you know, we are kind of for advisors by advisors and, for us, it's it's all about leverage. You know, from the time my partner uh, and I originally got together 20 years ago, 
the you know the concept at the time because our branch manager at the time thought it was crazy the no this teams thing was just ridiculous nobody did it nobody you know and but the the concept then was you know i had an interest in planning due to some old family circumstances my partner and his dad had been in investments i was 22 years old when i got into the business so you know most of the folks with a a million dollar rollover weren't looking at a 22 year old saying, you know what, I really would like to entrust my life savings to this child. And so being able to say, you know what, I could leverage your investment experience at the time they didn't do really planning wasn't something that they offered. And, And that was really the early beginnings of it. And it really just has expanded from there. What I've found is when you get to a certain size, and, and we're getting there. Uh, I mean, again, there are plenty of firms that are that are bigger than than ours. Is that you can continually upgrade the level of talent by doing it together. So you you know if you're most folks don't need if you have a hundred million dollar practice. You know, again, one of the practices that we acquired was a hundred million dollars you know, 150 clients and it was an advisor and an assistant. And he didn't need, he wouldn't have needed a full-time planner because he did a fair amount of that, or he didn't need, you know, a full-time anything. And so being able to collaborate and kind of co-op, I think that, that businesses outside of the industry have done it for a long time. And so, being able to have an exceptional person in a particular area, kind of their unique ability is X. Being able to have access to that person is important, but feeling like you have to, a lot of times as we were growing in my practice, you had somebody that you hired to be a particular position, but they only had 50% of their time allocated to that and you had to find something different for them to do that was of value for the rest of it and this way what we found is we we don't have as much of that yeah well the the i always joke i mean the the hardest staff member to hire as an advisor is your first one because it's really expensive when you double your headcount for sure because that's what happens when you go from one to two like the you know for for a business like when you got 20 employees and you hire your 21st like it's a business decision. Uh, you know, it takes a small slice of your margins. You make a decision to reinvest. Like it's not that lumpy of a cost because of the size of the organization at that point. But when you hire your first and you double your headcount, like doubling your headcount is very expensive and challenging in any business. And you just, you can't get there fractionally or it's hard to get there fractionally. I think you can do more of that than you used to with the rise of virtual assistant, virtual paraplanner services. And and there's certainly a lot more that you can outsource than, than you could before, but it's still a challenge. You still have to find and manage those people. And so a, a firm that comes and just says, look, we give all this to you and it's centralized and we train them and manage them and oversee them. Here you go. You want to sign up like, well, as you're finding that the, there are definitely advisors who sign up for that. No doubt. And I think you mentioned an interesting point. Uh, you know, one of the areas where we've had success is in, you know, not feeling like, and, and this is a, a, another kind of the independent, uh, the flexible nature of being independent has allowed us the ability to do things like remote and fractional work. At one point we had, uh, actually, I think we still use them, uh, a, you know, our graphics design and marketing team that put together a lot of things was in Romania and you had the ability to, you know, we have team members in, I think we have eight offices in three states, but we have team members in six. And so six different states because they, they do things from wherever they are and, and having that virtual capability is, is a big deal. But when you're running your practice, every day and it's the only thing you know you you have to focus on that the notion of going out and sourcing folks who who can do some of these things is I mean, it just doesn't even hit the radar so how many staff members are under signature that are kind of doing all this support stuff like what's what does the headcount look like for the organization 
There are so, you know, if you look at kind of across the organization, we have 31 team members. That's including in the in the branches, advisors, team members from a at this point from a kind of we'll call it a home office staff, for lack of a better word. There are about six. There are six. Some of us, myself, for example, also work, you know, I still have clients and work in my practice as well. And then we have committed to hiring two, we have two new folks who are starting in January. So first of the year. So talk to us about the growth strategy for you from here. Like I'm particularly struck since you've got this sort of two edge piece, like you have advisors where you're acquiring them and then you have advisors where they're affiliating into you. So what's the growth strategy and vision from here? Like, are you, are you still trying to do both? Are you expecting that over time you're going to do more of one than the other? Like, how do you view the path? Well, that's a good question. Yeah. You know, a big part of that, uh, at least in the, so if you had asked me three years ago, how we would have grown to this point, I don't know that it followed the script, that, that I would have had. So I, I think that, you know, the market will dictate that to some point. But I think that, you know, when you look at our business as a whole, one of the, you know, acquiring a practice is a lot of work. It's uh, one of those things that we know will be a part of our business going forward, particularly, you know, one of the things One of the benefits of being part of a group like ours is if you decided that you were ready to, you know, transition in in some way, you know, sell your practice, we will be ready to acquire it. So if any of our folks, you know, and and that's one of the terms that that one of our advisors uh, who joined us this year said, you know, you guys have kind of institutionalized the succession process because they joined us as an affiliate, but they know that in the next five or six years, they're going to want want to to sell their practice. So we're working with them on building out kind of the team structure to be able to acquire that. So we will always, acquisitions will definitely always be a part of, of what we do because we believe in Bring again. I started in financial services when I was 22 years old. I had taught school for a year, and you know was able to to talk my way into this business. And so I'm a big believer in bringing along young people and giving them opportunities to you know to get into the business, even from varying backgrounds. Most of you know, a lot of our younger advisors don't necessarily have you know they aren't though we are recruiting more in this direction, they're not coming from a CFP program. I have a good friend, Josh Harris, who who runs the CFP program at Clemson, who has helped us a lot with internships and things like that. And so bringing along young folks is a, it's a passion of mine because I had an opportunity when I was really young to get into the business. And, and I don't, I don't know that as much, it doesn't seem to some extent that as much of that opportunity exists Today, I just a lot of the training and and things like that seems to have, you know, there's just not as much of it. But so we know that we'll always be developing talent and doing some acquisitions. I would expect for, you know, probably at least 2019 and 2020 for the affiliation model to be uh, an area where we expect to grow an awful lot more because I think there are a lot of folks between mergers and acquisitions in the regional and wirehouse space. There are a lot of folks who want to be independent, but don't want to deal with some of the things that are required in setting up a business and figuring out some of the legal things. And there are a lot of people who don't want to have to deal with those things. And and we feel like we've kind of got a solution for that that still allows them to get into and run an independent business, but not have to deal with the things that for a lot of advisors, they just want to meet with clients. And so we think that with what's going on kind of in the space, that that presents the biggest opportunity for the next couple of years is folks who want to come out of the the regional space or the wirehouse space and build something of their own, but build it with some other people to kind of put their shoulder to to the stone and, and help them. 
So how do you find advisors that want to that want to affiliate or, or tuck in or do this in the first place? I feel like that's actually one of the biggest challenges for a lot of advisors that want to grow their business by having more advisors affiliate to them is it's it's just hard to find those advisors. And it, it kind of seems like everybody's recruiting them right now because, you know, there's a lot of reasons to pursue money in motion. So like, how are you finding advisors that would even be interested in this? How do you find them? How do you reach out to them? How do you communicate to them? Sure. A lot of them are, you know, it begins with relationships. And so much like, you know, I, I've been impressed with what you guys have been able to do with XYPN over a, a relatively short period of time where, you know, it, it starts in some cases, in our case at least, you know, it's folks that you know who, you know, having been uh, a part of a, a regional firm, you know, even though not all of the folks that I know have an interest in going independent, we certainly have over the last three years had a lot of folks call and ask what the process was like. How is it? One of them has joined us. A couple of them have gone RIA. So being a resource to folks who are interested in what kind of independence has to offer and what the difference is between the two spaces. Again, I think you can kind of get caught in that space and and not know what else is out there. So a lot of it has to do re- with relationships is a is a big first part. And how do you explain the nature of independence to them? Well, I think the first thing I do is ask them to explain to me kind of what their pain points are. I, I think that every advisor has a a different experience with, with whoever their, uh, you know, um, BD service provider is. And then what I try to do is compare and contrast to the extent that, you know, again, if they were calling from somewhere with, that I've worked, I, ha- I have more insight. But I think that the biggest thing with being on the independent side is the flexibility to have access to if not everything that you might want, most things that you might want and the ability to, you know, most advisors that I talk to have particularly those, again, in a more captive type space, uh, have the growth minded ones, the ones who would even consider independence, have either a different financial planning software that they'd like to be able to use, some form of marketing that they like to be able to do that they just aren't able to do. And so having a conversation about what's possible in kind of our world compared to the more captive space and and really just understanding what it is that they, that they aren't happy about. Everybody who, who calls is unhappy about something for some folks it's marketing and the ability to call. (laughs) Right. Uh, And for other people, it's the technology, you know, for us, when we were kind of exploring our options, technology was a big component you know, of that. And, you know, wanting to feel like we were going to partner with a firm that had the kind of technology that made doing business simple. And so when we chose Raymond James, that was a big part of that because for us and for the kind of business that we we do, it and we're a planning first, investments second firm, you know, the the investments kind of meld into or the implementation of the the planning. Raymond James had a really solid planning solution and reporting and a lot of those things that that really were streamlined and made for us, it made doing business and building systems around doing the business made it easy. And so talking through some of those things a lot of times for advisors who are in uh, a different situation can be pretty eye-opening. It strikes me that you know, when you're talking about kind of the the appeals of independence and flexibility, like I feel like there was a point years ago where advisors that were in wirehouses, BDs, like captive firms, the appeal of flexibility was just I, I, I want a wider – product shelf. Like I just, I don't want to have to only do my company's products. I want a, a, a more open access platform around uh, insurance or investment solutions or whatever we're, we're using. And that, 
you know, while there's still a few firms like that, increasingly more and more have some reasonably open structures and architecture, at least around product selection. And that, you know, as, as you're saying, like when, when we talk about what does it mean to have more flexibility on the independent side now, like it's, it's not flexibility of product choice necessarily. It's flexibility around things like marketing and technology. It's just a striking contrast in how much the world has changed that that's the, uh, those are the kinds of things that, that, drive a decision making switch now not not just the products on the shelf and the availability of them yeah i think if you think about it for most people i mean we all believe or or, you know advisors believe that people do business with people and you know it's a, a and different firms have different ways of of saying it but but ultimately our clients do business with us and it's important to be able to to put that out there, I mean, it, for people to understand who you are, why you're different is a big thing these days. If you look at, I mean, you, you with your Nerds Eye View blog and a lot of the things that you guys do to generate inbound interest in, in some of the various things that you do to be captive in a way that doesn't allow you to do that it's a hindrance. And so it, it can really be a hurdle for some people to be able to to do more. And for us, looking at what other businesses can do relative to what we can do as advisors, you know, it's important to me to be able to get closer and closer to being able to do the same kinds of things that it to implement technology solutions that other people can to have access to virtual workers and and to be able to expand in ways that that any other kind of business that that we would see that's the big frustration i think sometimes is the notion that other businesses again small to mid-sized businesses can do certain things but because the industry we're in or because of the captive nature of, of some you know firms or cultures we're not able to do that and i think there's I think that comparison for a lot of advisors can be frustrating and, and marketing and technology are two areas where that is, where the difference is the starkest. So you, you've got this base of advisors that you've got relationships that you've known over the years and, and have, uh, you've been having the conversations with them and some of them find their way to you because you went independent and they want to know what it's like. Are you looking at other uh, like marketing strategies or approaches like, as signature to say, how else are we going to find firms that want to affiliate with us? And and are you looking more external to Raymond James? Or are you also looking at this like internal to Raymond James, just saying like, hey, let's find the other Ray J advisors in the area and and have them affiliate in as well? Sure. Well, I mean, we definitely are, uh, you know, we've had our own website kind of for signature and advisor facing website, uh, join signature wealth.com advisor facing content that talks about some of the things that, that we do in terms of, of building a practice and how we structure things. And, you know, so we do some, we do some content marketing in that way. I personally, for younger advisors this year, kind of put together a, a book, that's from me personally, that is more about uh, getting into, breaking into and building a scalable business for, for younger people. And so so we really are focused on doing more proactive you know, market. We, we've spent the first two or three years really building out the capabilities. And so for the last six months or so, we've been focused on beginning to enhance kind of the level of content that we're putting out there, either via our website at some point, you know, uh, doing interviews like this and, and having an opportunity to tell the story is really good for us. I, I think that ultimately it's about building relationships and just having conversations with people, whether you're talking about uh, advisor to advisor or when we as advisors are out, uh, you know, trying to attract clients. That's really what it's all about, having an opportunity to tell a story. So, you know, we've been much more active on the content front here in the last uh, six months or so, and uh, we'll focus a lot on that. We have 
had a, a lot of folks inbound because, uh, again, two of my partners are former wholesalers. So we have uh, some contacts in, in that way, but we are definitely, uh, you know, you only know so many people, which I think is what you were kind of uh, alluding to. Now, I would also point out that to build a really big firm, you don't have to know a lot of people. And, and for us, you know, we definitely are mindful of, you know, the kinds of folks that that we want to build a, a business with, but it is, you know, marketing to other advisors and, and having those conversations is something that's, you know, a key component of our, our growth strategy going forward. So you've talked about that you've got these two pieces of the business. Like there's the affiliate side we've been talking about where you're taking advisors in and providing the support structure for them. And then you said you've also acquired three offices and, and it made the note that I've heard from a few advisors that have acquired firms that uh, acquiring a practice is a lot of work. So can you tell us about what the acquisition process looks like for you? Like what kinds of firms do you buy? What do you do? How do you actually transition them? What does that process look like for you? Well, the, you know, the actual acquisition is ultimately kind of the implementation of that is uh, about as unique as the advisor who is, you know, who is going to be retiring. And so we've had a couple of different experiences. I'll share those with you. And and so the first uh, was an advisor who wanted to retire and relatively quickly, he had been looking for a succession kind of plan or partner for a number of years. And yeah, it was just at a, a point where he was ready to be finished. And so with that one, we ended up having a younger advisor who had been with us for a couple of years. And he moved to, that was in Greenville, South Carolina. So it was about three hours away from Florence. And we had a young advisor who was in his mid-20s who moved up there to function kind of as a relationship manager and went through a process where he met with most of the clients with the senior advisor. We came in as you know my partners and I and met with them as well to demonstrate that it was a, a team effort. And within about, I'd say, six months or so, the advisor, uh, the uh, legacy advisor was to the point where over the first six months, we did the introductions and meetings with all, all of us and the legacy advisor. And then he began to, over the second six months after, you know, from say months seven, eight, and nine, he came into the office less and less frequently. And then the last three months, he was on kind of on call. So he would answer questions if we had any in particular. But, you know, one of the things that, that we did that was particularly effective there was we made use of dictation. You know, so a, a copy talk type prescription uh, subscription and had the uh, a list of questions for the senior advisor and he would would answer those so that we would have some background on the clients went through and met each one of them individually and then kind of applied our standard service schedule to those clients with a rollout of this is you know, this is why we actually did a video with the, you know, us and the advisor who was going to retire talking about he and my partner who was, who used to be a regional director, had a longstanding relationship. So we kind of, each one of these, if you look at our experience so far, each one of these mergers or acquisitions has a story. And so we try to tell the story to the client and then explain from the client's point of view what the benefit of the the partnership is for them. And really, we have a fairly standardized kind of service process then that we roll out to the clients, let them know what their expectations should be, introduce them to the team. And, you know, so for, for him, it was a, he had about a one year kind of ramp. We'd love to have more time than that. But, you know, it is sometimes, you know, we aren't operating necessarily on our schedule. I found that a lot of advisors who are getting closer to retirement, what they say to me is, I wish I had started building a team five years ago 
But by the time I get, you know, have gotten ready to retire, I, ju- I just don't have it. And so what we've been able to offer you know, to somebody like him is an instant team. You've got an investment person who can come in and help with the portfolios. You've got a relationship manager. You've got a planner. So, Sorry, I was just going to ask. And, and so part of the way that you position this to the client as well is – you know, your your advisor is leaving, but we're bringing in this whole team to support you and and replace you. And that both, I guess, becomes part of the transition communication to the client and is also how you support the young advisor that's going in because the client doesn't just see young advisor coming in. They see young advisor and more senior partner who may or may not be there in all the meetings and all these their team resources. And like that's I guess that that's how you build client trust in an otherwise younger advisor who may struggle with client trust. Absolutely. And then we also we do two events per year in each practice location. So where you know, our investment manager and I uh, or one of the kind of senior partners, whoever is you know geographically appropriate, I guess, in, in a way, will go in and really do a, a client workshop twice a year, kind of what we call it uh, a kickoff in January and a halftime in, I'm a big football fan, so I try to keep things simple for myself and go in and talk about the planning process, what's going on, where things are in, in the market, new things that they need to talk about. And we do that in conjunction with the younger advisor to cement the notion that this person, and we don't make any illusions on the local level that this person is alone because we, we present it as, you know, from the beginning, you know, we tell the story of why the advisor chose us, why it is, you know, what the benefits are of them working with us and and how things are going to go from the beginning. And, And what we have found is having a process for how you do things. In a lot of cases, you know, some advisors haven't had an organized proactive contact structure and some of those kinds of things. Being able to communicate that to the client and the retiring or legacy advisor, being able to tell their story as to why they chose us is, we've had phenomenal retention as a result of, of just positioning is a big deal, I think, in those situations. Okay. So how did some of the other acquisitions then differ from that scenario? So another good example would be the, we had one who joined us uh, just a couple months ago, who was a a younger advisor who uh, had been operating in a practice with his father. So his father had one business and he had a a different practice in a, a separate location. And unfortunately his, his dad passed away and for a couple of years he had been juggling both. So he had been splitting his time between two locations and, you know, r- that wasn't what originally he intended. He wanted to live in, in uh, Wilmington or uh, Leland, which is right beside Wilmington, North Carolina, and now had taken responsibility for another practice that was an hour uh, away. And that really just long-term wasn't something that he was really excited about. And so it became a situation where for him, he could he affiliated with us and, and still runs his individual practice that he originally started, but we acquired the legacy practice and have placed a, another young advisor down in that practice to be able to run it. They'll utilize our systems, but uh, it was just a situation where this advisor didn't want to be, you know, a business owner in that capacity. It wasn't what he had built out and planned for himself. And so having access to a, a bigger structure was of benefit to him. So in one case, you know, the first one, the advisor wanted to retire. In another case, you know, the younger guy uh, who's more my age wanted to be an advisor, but for the most part, other than running his practice, he didn't want to be a, a business owner having multiple office locations and things like that. So we gave him a good kind of out for being able to continue to do what he liked to do but be able to sell us the the legacy business that really wasn't part of his 
focus run, run in both operations. So those are two good examples of how an acquisition can kind of come to pass. Interesting. So in essence, the like the son sold his dad's practice that he inherited, but didn't actually want to be working and servicing. So he could go back to his practice that he had all along. That's right. And it, it just goes to the nature of sometimes, you know, particularly on the independent side, we can end up in situations that uh, they were unexpected. And uh, whether that's waiting, you know, closer to retirement or, um, you know, or just ending up with a, a practice that was bigger or more cumbersome than you wanted. Uh, I, I think that having a, a backstop, a, a, an additional or a larger structure, if you will, to be able to support that in one way or another is, you know, is just a, a an additional, a unique opportunity that we've been able to provide for a couple of different types of advisors. So you'd commented that, you know, again, like acquiring a practice is a lot of it's a lot of work. So what's been the biggest surprises to you between, you know, like how you thought it was going to go when you started acquiring firms and then then how it actually turns out when you go through the process of acquiring firms? I think that, you know, anytime you start into any new business endeavor, it, it begins kind of with a hypothesis. And, and ours was that, you know, you could bring in a younger advisor to a legacy advisor's practice and that it could be well received and you could bridge the two. That was kind of the the hypothesis when we started. And, you know, one of the things I, I hate to say it, one of the surprising things for me was that it worked. I, it was just, it worked about, you know, you kind of ended up like the dog that caught the car, you know, what are you going to do with it now? And it's been a very pleasant surprise for us, the ability to retain the client relationships and how receptive they have been has been you know, a, a very pleasant surprise. I, I think that from a, an amount of work standpoint, I think that, and, and you may know it academically, but it's a little bit different in practice is how much client and institutional knowledge that advisors keep in their head. And so having to develop a not just the processes, but about the people and the the little things, the nuances of relationship, figuring out the ways to uh, get those out of, you know, a senior advisor's head and the the kinds of things that that you'll need to know to transition a client relationship. I think you know figuring that out was something that was somewhat unexpected for us trying to figure exactly how all of that needed to go and what information you needed to know. And and I think that as we evolve, we, you know, in all of our processes, it's about, you know, every time we do something, we do kind of an after action review. I think the term comes from the military to, you know, say what worked and what didn't and to try to make the next, in this case, acquisition better than the last one by, you know, smoothing out any rough spots that we had. And I guess that's where that process evolved, where you're using tools like copy talk and, and I guess essentially having the advisor do a, a brain dump of just, here's everything I know and can think of about this client. Let's dump it into a recording. Absolutely. And, and there's a big difference between saying, how about turn on the recorder and tell us everything you know about the client? There's a big difference between that and giving them a list of questions and prompts to be able to answer. I think that's part of that evolution is over time, you, you don't know what you don't know. But once you find out, it's a good idea to write it down so that you you memorialize it. Yeah. So now you actually have like a questionnaire thing. Like here's the whatever is the three questions, the five questions, the 10 questions that you've got to talk through with every client and the copy talk as we're coming up on the next meeting so that we know what's going on and we can transition them successfully. Right. Uh, well, it's almost a, a questionnaire for the advisor. And, and this works. I actually am about to go through it with one of our associate advisors here in our practice with my clients so that it works just as well inside of a team to, you know, essentially the client's name goes at the top and there are you know, 10 or 15 things about that relationship that it would be helpful for anybody who talks to them to know, you know, married. And and some of these things are evident on the, the new, you know, some of your internal paperwork, but others aren't, you know, where they went to college. Do they have a favorite 
hobby. Just things that, uh, again, there may not, uh, an advisor may not know the answer and that's okay, but it's important to have asked the question because it's the kind of thing that, you know, some of those smaller things that that allow us to, because originally when you're first coming into a new relationship, whether you're taking over for whether you're you're beginning to manage the relationship from inside an internal team or whether you're doing an acquisition, some of those kinds of things, even the small things that you may not typically think of, give a new advisor an opportunity to build a relationship and build rapport by having access to, you know, you're not going to spout off that, you know, the, you know, the client went to Clemson because the advisor told you so, but you, you may weave it into a conversation that allows you to build uh, some rapport and relationship with that person. And if you don't ask the senior advisor the question, chances are a lot of that stuff is never going to be something that would come up. If you just said, tell us everything you know, it's usually going to be occupation, you know, things that you could read off of a new account form. We want to be able to get a little deeper than that. And uh, out of curiosity, is this a, a formal questionnaire thing you'd be willing to share out for other advisors? Just the, I don't know, the questionnaire, like th- things you need to know if you're taking over a client. Sure. Yeah, I'd be happy to uh, to pass that along. Okay. We'll include it in the show notes then. So for Folks who are listening, this is uh, episode 105. And so if you go to kitsis.com slash 105, we'll have a copy of Chip's questionnaire of all the stuff you want to make sure you ask about when you're taking over a, a client relationship from an existing advisor. So Chip, I'm curious about like the evolution for you. you so when you transitioned out a couple of years ago to the, to the more independent side, I mean, you had said like you wanted – more flexibility to do some more stuff, but like, was it your vision? I want to build this platform where we're acquiring and affiliating advisors and try to be at a billion dollars in a couple of years. Like, was that what you were shooting for or is that just kind of what happened? And now, you know, business is business and it's grown. It is, it is definitely grown faster than I originally anticipated. You know, we, as I may have mentioned, you know, we had a partner who worked remotely from, uh, Myrtle Beach, which is about 60 miles from from Florence, and so what we knew was, yeah, you know, our town is uh, it's a great place to live, but it's only so big. It's it's not a big metropolitan area, and so you know, no matter how much you increase your market share, when you're in a small to mid sized market, it's only so big. And so to to grow, you know, a, a good bit bigger, we were going to need to expand geographically. We already had a partner who lived in another town, and my original expectation was that we would open an office there and that would, you know, that we would build a team around that advisor. And then we would eventually find other advisors who, for whom kind of the process worked. What I didn't, and so the concept of what we've ended up building was definitely part of the vision. It really caught fire when we had an opportunity to have my my former wholesaler and and his group, you know, when they were considering Raymond James, that opened up, you, you know, what I have found is anytime you begin a new relationship with, you know, like with, with our partners in Charlotte, there are typically two or three advisors that they know who may be interested in doing something similar. And so that's kind of, you know, when we talked to them and they decided that they would want to be part of us, they had talked to you know, somebody else who was trying to do something similar and it became a, you know, a situation where a little bit like a, a Venn diagram where the two circles meet in the middle and you have that that overlap. And it's kind of, uh, you know, I've been an advisor for 20 years. My partner who ended up joining us has been in regional management for about that same period of time. And so who, who had some different skill sets than ours. And it became a situation where you begin to get to introduce to other people. And that really has kind of a, a had a, a ripple effect in, you know, folks that, that the different partners know has really accelerated the process faster than, than I would have originally anticipated. So that's been, uh, again, the vision was very similar, but it, it has definitely grown bigger, faster than I expected. And I guess that's part of the dynamic of just being in a, 
in a smaller town environment that, you know, the, I guess the bad news is there's only so many advisors to network your way to, but the good news is there may actually not be a lot of other people calling on them in the first place. Like I'm just, I'm imagining some of this in our DC metropolitan area here. And like the advisor world is so dense. Like I, I feel like ed- anybody who's thinking about retiring and selling their practice probably has a dozen firms calling them before they're even ready, just saying like, hey, I noticed you're an advisor DC area and you're kind of old. So if you ever want to sell, just give me a call. Right. It seems like there's there's more opportunity for you in the in a smaller market because they just there isn't that much dense outbound activity happening. I think too that the other thing is, you know, again for for us, none of the advisors that we've recruited have been in Florence, so we haven't added anybody in our local market. Everybody has been from outside of the market because when you know in uh, again in a smaller town, most of the offices here are of the you know regional or wirehouse bank wirehouse nature and in a lot of cases they aren't bringing on younger folks but they've been together for a long time and so the notion of one of them breaking away from kind of their uh, I'll call it click of advisors a group of guys who's been together even though they have separate practices they've been in the same office for a long time is not there's not a lot of movement and so you know, our experience has been that by going to bigger markets, uh, again, a Charlotte, for example, there is an, an awful lot of, of opportunity for people or, you know, again, bigger for me is Greenville, South Carolina, uh, is, you know, going to places where there are folks who are, you know, one or two person shops who just really haven't looked into other alternatives or who haven't found kind of the right, the right fit for them. It's a little bit like, you know, our, we're small, we're big enough to be able to get some, some of the economies of scale, but small enough that I can rattle off all of our team members names off the top of my head. So it's a little bit like cheers, kind of a, you want to get to go where everybody knows your name and be building able to being able to do that, I think has been helpful, but it's not, it's not easy, at least in our location, having small town because you've got four or five advisors who've been together for years and years. They haven't developed any team members, but you know, at this point, they aren't old enough, at least the ones locally for the most part, aren't quite ready to retire. So hopefully uh, they'll look us up when you know, when we get to that point. But it, it is, I just think it's, for us, it's been a you know, right place, right time from a standpoint of all the mergers going on in the, the regional space, you know, people, I went through a period where I switched business. I stayed at the same desk, but switched business cards like three times really early in my career. And yeah, people get tired of that. And I I think that, you know, it's just been an, an interesting time in the, the business that, you know, I think that we're in a good place at the right time where people are more receptive to the notion of independence than they ever have been. But, you know, having the capabilities of a little bit bigger group to be able to help with that, to make it easier is, you know, uh, again, I hate to say I, it's, it's not like we didn't mean to, to go in this direction, but I certainly think that it's been accelerated by just kind of where the market in the advisory space is right now. So, what does this look like for you personally as the business evolves? Like I know you had said you were on the advisor side, you started out as an advisor. Like are you are you still client facing? Are you now mostly recruiting and just trying to deal with all the hiring and transitions and the rest that go with all this growth of acquisitions and affiliations? Like what's the role look like for you and how's it evolving as you go through the growth? Sure. Well, for me personally, it's probably, I'm probably about 50-50 right now in terms of client facing and then working kind of on the business versus in the business. I actually, I think it was back in 2002, read the E-Myth and uh, I was on vacation and, and, you know, one of the things that it kind of worked me through at least was the notion of building out your organizational chart. And, you know, if you're the only one 
doing any of the work. You put your name in all the boxes and you slowly kind of recruit to fill that. And I, I still have, uh, I actually wrote it out on the back of a paper plate because it was like the midnight on vacation. And, and and so I just, for me personally, I slowly have worked at that. I, I had a partner at the time I did planning, he did investments. And it's been something that I've slowly worked at that over time, finding other people who were better than me at kind of the individual components. And so I've tried to build our team in, in that way to find folks who's, I'm a big believer in, uh, you know, I'm part of the strategic coach program with Dan Sullivan, big believer in the concept of unique ability and, you know, doing the things that, that you're best at. And so we've tried to really use that as a a means of continuing to grow out the, the rest of the structure of the company to free me up some. So for those who aren't familiar with it, can you just talk through a little bit of like what strategic coach unique ability framework is? Sure. Well, it's, I mean, I've heard similar versions referred to, you know, in other terms, superpower, you know, but essentially it is really kind of drilling down and figuring out what you know you are good at that that is fascinating and motivating for you and then creating a a team framework around you in such a way that you're able to to do that or spend the majority of your time doing that while other people inside your company are focused on on other areas and it, it really is a you know, very much the focusing on your strengths and then finding other people who have capabilities to handle some of the other things so that you can focus on on your one thing. You know, I, I've heard it explained a lot of different ways. We, we kind of, you know, one of the ways that I've explained it to our team is, and I, I'd ask you, Michael, if you had a choice between if you needed help from a superhero, would you rather have help from the Hulk or the Flash? Kind of depends on the situation. <laughs> Exactly. And and I think that that is, you know, both of those characters, if you will, kind of have different strengths and weaknesses. If your kid was trapped under a car, you'd want the Hulk. Uh, But if you had to get something across town in uh, a minute, you'd need access to the Flash. And, And I think that it's a lot like, you know, for us, I kind of view it as, you know, ideally you'd rather have access to the Justice League or or one of those groups of superheroes where everybody's good at something and, you know, you're you're really using the collective to to give access to that. And so for me, it has been, you know, one of my unique abilities is in building teams and uh, recognizing strengths in other people and helping bring those together kind of in service of whether it's the client or the advisor facing organization. And the more time I'm able to do that, the more successful we are early on in my career as compared to, particularly as compared to my partner, you know, my unique ability, relatively speaking, was in the area of planning. And so, you know, we decided that it was best for, I only did planning, you know, again, now for 20 years, yeah, I only did planning from very early on and I focused on what I was good at and he did the same and we just did it for the same group of clients. And we've just expanded that over the years to include some of these other areas where, you know, insurance specialization you know, for an advisor who is dealing with our clients, but then also somebody who specializes in things, some of the back office things like compliance and benefits. It's been a constant addition of kind of the next new team member. And so you just kind of found these are unique, your unique abilities to just, you do them, it's what you fell into. Like you were the planning person early on. Now you're the team's person and talent development and recruiting, I guess. To some extent, I, I think that in a team, it's a little bit like Jenga, if some one of the the pieces moves, they all move, and so you have to evaluate kind of where the the strength is structurally, and then you know adjust to that. I, I think that people, you know, one of the things about building an organization is we're, we're dealing with people, and people are not 
static. Uh, I don't know about you. I've changed a lot over the last 20 years. And so, you know, for us, it, it's about continuing to evaluate it. If we have a team member who joins us, who has a, a unique set of skills. So for example, you know, one of the, the books that I read in the last year or so that's been really impactful for me and for our business is one called Rocket Fuel by Gino Wickman and uh, and Mark Winters. And you know, it, it essentially talks about the importance of the fact that there is a difference, you know, in what they call the visionary and the integrator. And you know, both of them are incredibly important. The book refers to them as a two-piece puzzle. And, you know, it is important to understand that they are both leaders of an organization, but they, they have different kind of skills and capabilities. The visionary is more of the forward-looking, you know, next new idea, whereas the integrator is the, you know, get things done, keep things organized. I have found, you know, and so after reading that book uh, about a year ago, one of my partners who had a 20 years of experience in management, you know, we were both, we were honestly dealing with a little bit of a, an internal struggle of leadership of, you know, it, you can only have kind of so many leaders. And, and sometimes when you come together, it's hard to figure out where everybody fits. And, and for us, and I, I read the the book Rocket Fuel, and it really just, you know, I, it's like somebody got me for the first time, you know, that, that this, and it was okay for me to, you know, I, when I read the description of the visionary in the book, you know, things like, uh, you know, generates two, 20 new ideas a week, one of which is good and three of which could completely kill the company is it just resonated with me that, you know what, that's, and it talks about how that kind of person also needs an integrator to, I've often joked, you know, whether it's uh, in personal relationships, you know, with your spouse or partner or business relationships, every relationship has a gas and a break. And if you have two gases, you're you're going to run in the ditch eventually. If you have two breaks, you never go anywhere. And I, I think that the visionary integrator relationship, kind of as it was described in that book, is the same as that kind of gas break analogy where, you know, for me as a visionary, I'm always plowing forward. The next idea is always better than the last idea. And for me, I I read it. I said, this really seems like you know, my partner and me, I gave it to him and he said, well, I guess I'm an integrator. And, you know, you you could just, but you could see that for us, it laid out a structure of how those two types of leaders could not only peacefully coexist, but the reason I guess that they named the book Rocket Fuel is it really, when those two kinds of folks get together, it can really propel an organization forward. And it's been a big, you know, launch point for us to really be able to say, you know what, I'm this way. You, you have these capabilities and skills. We should just follow the roadmap uh, of how these two personalities, if this one seems a lot like me and the integrator seems a lot like you, we should just follow the roadmap of uh, how they suggest two people like us should get along. And, and we've r- really worked really hard over the last year or so at, at doing that. And it's been, it's been a, a huge, not just professional growth, but also, you know, I would say our relationship as partners has drastically improved because it gives us a different framework for understanding each other. Yeah. I'm uh, I had first read rocket fuel. Well, I guess like a, a year, a year and a half ago as well. I think it, I think it probably came out in 2016 or, or early 2017 and found it just fascinating as as well that you know as you said it paints this picture of visionaries and integrators and they kind of make the good point that like when you look at a lot of the famous businesses in history including ones that have really uh, well known visionary founders like most of them actually succeeded in large part because they had key integrators that actually held the thing together as well and you don't always see them because they're usually a little more internal and behind the scenes but like you know, Walt Disney was the great visionary, but Walt also, I think, nearly bankrupted Disney like three different times. It was his brother, Roy, who was the integrator who actually kept the wheels on the bus 
and turned Walt's great vision into something that also functioned as a great company. And, you know, we, you know, Steve Jobs was the visionary, but Wozniak was the one that helped keep it all together. And Bill Gates was the great visionary, but Balmer in the early years helped keep it all together. And and that a lot of time visionaries are supported by these integrator roles. And, and I mean, that's, I feel like that almost makes it sound like lesser for the integrator. Like the, the key point of the book is these are really two essential roles that need each other. Like great integrators often struggle if they don't have someone painting a vision of where to go and great visionaries that just paint directions of where to go will go 20 directions and, di- and divide themselves and kill the business if they don't have an integrator that keeps it all together. And it's, it's all about the, the coexistence of the two and and then recognizing some of the tensions that come forward. I know one of the big things that they always that they push hard in the book is like and when the visionary disagrees with the integrator, the integrator always gets the final say because they're the ones that can actually figure out what the business can execute or not because the visionary otherwise just can spin it up and kill it. And that's tough, right? I mean it, it is it's regardless of which role you fall into. And I, I would say this in case anybody goes out and reads the book in either case it's humbling because, you know, as the, you know, as a visionary, first off, it is hard to go around and say, you know, I'm the visionary. It, it, it feels a little bit weird, but you know, it, it's humbling to say, you know what, I'm probably not the best person to deal with some of the day to day of I'm as a visionary, I can say for myself, I'm not always the best communicator because in my head, I understand how everything works. You know, I I know exactly how I laid this out, but you know, in, in our case, a lot of times, you know, I make it up. My partner makes it real. And there's a big difference sometimes I think between the two is in for the visionary in the book, the way it, it lays out is when you get into the day to day, you're right. The integrator gets the final say. If we can't agree in the day to day operations, the integrator gets the final say. And, and one of the things for me as somebody who had who, who brought in a partner who is now the integrator to a practice that I was already kind of the 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 CEO of the manager of or whatever and to you say to, to surrender your own power <laughs> and to say to your your folks from now on if there's a question you need to talk to Whitley you know and that's a it's all of it and and that's true of everything I, I think in building a business like like ours yours or mine it is a constant state of humbling and looking at the fact that the you know, the organization's bigger than you are, regardless of which of the roles that you're fa- falling into. And it was hard for me as the visionary to, you know, to say, all right, from now on in the day to day, you're going to have to talk to this other person. It was, it was, I'm sure, difficult for him to say, you know what, I, I'm a an integrator. And while I may have, you know, some idea about the future, I recognize that this other person is really the visionary. And I think that that is a, yeah, it's humbling either way. And I just think that that's important for, for anybody to understand that it goes both ways for sure. I, I love how you just frame it though. I, I make it up. My partner makes it real. It's a, it's a good way to, to explain the blend, but I, it, to me, like it's, it's also very empowering because it, you know, it, it says to integrators, like you don't have to come up all with all of this stuff. Like, find a visionary who comes up with this stuff and you can turn it real. And I think for the visionaries to say like, it's actually okay if you're not sure how to execute everything that's bouncing around your head. It just means you need to find an integrator who who can, who can help make it real. You're just wired a certain way. And, you know, for me, I'm wired that, you know, coming up with new ideas come to me all the time, whether they're good or bad, they, that I have a, I never lack for some sort of, you know, squirrel, something shiny kind of, I always have something. And so, you know, for me, that's natural for me. It's going to happen. What's not going to happen is remembering to schedule certain things. I, I'm a big believer in Colby. I'm a nine quick start and a two follow through. And so you know, that's a dangerous mix if you're going to stay by yourself. And, and I think that, 
you know, we're big, you know, again, we kind of have eight things we tend to, to walk through. We kind of have a, a scorecard, if you will, that we walk through with our individual offices and, and you know, building the ideal team is, is one of those. And in doing that, it really is throughout the organization is a, a set of puzzle pieces that, you know, figuring out how to put together the, the right team in any level of an organization is just, it's just paramount. So speaking of kind of the the visionary role and saying the vision, what's the vision for you from from here? Like, where does Signature go from here? Well, I, I think that it's important. We've reached a stage where we feel like we have uh, enough size to be able to continue to, to specialize. I, I think that two things, you know, for me to see from a vision standpoint is we'd like to continue to expand uh, and, and add new practices, but to add it in a way where the entire organization gets better as a result of each new join. And so we've been developing kind of a, a, a structure of as new teams we have, for example, I mentioned earlier, we have a, a team of, of ladies who joined and they're an all women advisory practice who specializes in in working with women executives and so you know one of the things that I would you know envision us doing is finding ways for advisors in inside a signature to collaborate to be able to give our clients access to the best possible resource regardless of geography or specialty. So I, I would love to be able to partner uh, with or, or collaborate with that practice, for example, and, and to be able to build out a network that can collaborate with one another is uh, an important part. But it's also for me, culture is a, a big deal. You know, Next to the vision, developing the right culture is absolutely crucial. And so for for us, I think that the idea of growth for growth's sake is is not something that we that we want to do. We want to find the right people, and, and I also part of that group of people. It it seems easy to think that that would be we want to find the next retiring advisor. I want to find the next person who was like me. You know, I taught school. I taught sixth grade for a year. I like to joke that I was teacher for a year, which sounds a lot like teacher of the year if you say it fast enough that you can feel, but, but to find uh, a lot of our younger folks didn't come from wealthy families. They didn't come from backgrounds that are, you know, straight out of the, the finance kind of playbook. And so being able to find young people who want to get into the business, who just need the right opportunity is a big deal to me and, and to be able to see them, be successful. I take more personal pride in seeing, you know, our young guys get new clients and and build new relationships than I do doing it for myself. A, a big part of well, you know, signature for me was seeing us expand. I know that there are plenty of folks out there who are interested in finding good quality young people. I want to be able to find them too so that when you know, when somebody who's interested in finding a succession plan but doesn't want to do the work uh, or doesn't feel like they have the time or the inclination to to do all of that, that we can have some young people. And it's an investment on our part to go ahead and bring them in because it takes a couple of years before a young advisor is ready to to be able to be in that forward facing, you know, position. But, uh, you know, I, I think that that's a big part of the vision for me is continuing to develop a young, uh, a group of young people who are ready to be that next generation. So for as well as the path and journey is going, I'm just curious, like, what was the what was the low point for you in this journey? That's a good question. Yeah, I think the one of the more difficult situations that I've had recently is having a younger advisor leave. And so it's uh, anytime that you you build a team and you pour into people, it's difficult when somebody chooses not to be a part of that. And fairly recently, we had uh, a situation like that where 
again, we, we, we really promote and believe in the concept of, of being a family first organization. And that is not only our, our nuclear families at, at home, but also uh, a work family. And so anytime somebody for, for regardless of the reason decides that they don't want to be a part of that. Yeah. That, that was personally a lower uh, point for me is, is having somebody that I had put a lot into and, and, uh, uh, yeah, I loved the person, you know, choose not to be a part of the family anymore was, was really difficult. And I think that that's, but that's just part of what we, yeah, that's part of what we sign up for when you're trying to build mm-hmm. something is that you're going to invest in and care a lot about people. And sometimes, you know, one of the, the ways that I've described it with our team, because one of the things when in a bigger organization, for example, in, in a regional firm, for example, when somebody leaves, nobody knows. It becomes a like, well, I'm going to I'm going to call Michael. Where did Michael go? Don't even realize they're gone. Yep. You know, and it, well, and nobody wants to talk about it. You know, where did Michael go? Well, you know what? Michael just didn't really fit the culture here anyway. And so, you know, one of the things that, that I was having a conversation with one of our partners about is, you know, one of the things that I ended up communicating to our team was that this person had left. And, and I believe that kind of the example that I found was, I don't know if you're familiar with it's uh, kintsugi, I think is how it's pronounced, but it's in Japan. They take broken pottery and they actually mend it with gold so that they put the pieces back together. But it is it's done in such a way that they're mended and, and blended with gold inside the cracks. And and the philosophy behind it is that our you know, those rough parts, those low points, they, they aren't things to be ashamed of. They're part of what makes us over time makes the whole more valuable. And so I had heard that story and I just thought it was really cool. And so, you know, one of the things that I committed to is when we do have a low point, if somebody ever doesn't want to be in the family, then we tell everybody and we make that part of, you know, growing stronger together rather than minimizing the importance of the person while they were there enhancing the fact that sometimes you know fractures come in in businesses or relationships and they're part of what make us better and stronger rather than something that you know you just don't want to talk about like a lot of places I feel like do so I would say that's one of the you know lower points it, it really isn't our business is built on people not on markets and and those kinds of things and I think that that's been you know our highest points are because of people who decide to be a part of the organization. You know, we've got two new folks coming in in January that we're really excited about. We've had a lot of people you know, want to be a part of it from a, an acquisition or an affiliation standpoint. And those are those are the high points. They're about people. And, and the low points are every now and then, you know, for one reason or another, things aren't a good fit and people have to go different ways. And so, you know, for me, at least, the low points are about people, too. So as we wrap up, this is a a podcast about success and, you know, the funny coffee ups, that word is just success means different things to different people. So, you know, certainly the business is on a, a very successful trajectory, but I'm just wondering, like, how do you define success for yourself at this point? Well, originally, if you had asked me five years ago, you know, professionally and, and really kind of selfishly, personally, I, I have three boys. And, you know, so ideally, you know, I'm from a a small town and I wanted them to be able to be able to come back and work as a part of our organization without necessarily having to move home. And and so, you know, there was a time when growing to a point where we had more than one location so that they had options was a big deal. And and in that way, you know, I've accomplished, mission accomplished as far as that's concerned. Really now for me, it's uh, everything is more qualitative. And, and so I would say that for me, success for me now is building a life where every day, whether it's at home or at work, where I and, and, and anybody who's a part of our team is able to focus on only doing three things, doing things that they enjoy, that they're good at, and that benefits the team. And whether that team is their family at home or, you know, signature wealth at work, you know, I really think ultimately for us to live our, you know, what we call our signature life, that's what it's all about is, is doing things that you enjoy 
having the ability to, to focus on things that you're good at and recognizing that ideally those things are in service of something bigger than yourself and, you know, that makes the team around you better, whether it's at home or at work. I love it. I love that framing, uh, what doing what you enjoy, what you're good at and that benefits the team. That's right. Well, thank you, Chip, for joining us and sharing the journey on Financial Advisor Success Podcast. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate you having me. I've enjoyed talking. Absolutely. Likewise. Thank you. Want even more ideas, tools, and resources on how to break through to the next level of success as a financial advisor? Check out the leading financial planning industry blog, Nerd's Eye View, at www.kitsis.com where Michael covers the latest practice management trends and financial planning strategies. And by joining the members section, you can earn IMCA and CFP continuing education credits along with exclusive member content. Get it all now at www.kitsis.com.